And today we're very happy to have Kiara Toldo, who's with us here at Harvard. She's going to tell us about near extreme will desider black holes and JT gravity. So take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Okay, very good, very good. So I'm gonna talk about uh, this work that appeared. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't write it here, but uh, um, it appeared in collaboration with Alejandra Castro, who now is in Cambridge, and uh, and Francesca Mariani, who was a master student in um, in Amsterdam when I was before, and now she's a PhD student in Ghent. So it was a paper that appeared last month. So let me start with a brief then introduction and motivation. So the outline of my talk is this one. So I'll first give some motivation why to study this particular setup. Then I will tell you a bit more what is it uh, special about extremal and near extremal black holes. Then I will tell you, I will go to the core of this talk, which is the description of uh, Reiser Nostrum Desiter black holes. So they are black holes which are charged and they live in a space time with a positive cosmological constant. I will tell you a bit about the generalities, the causal, causal structure and their horizons, for instance. I will tell you also like the specific uh, thing that makes them very interesting, it, uh, that it's um, the fact that they could have three different extremal limits. And then I will describe the near horizon geometries and also the perturbations uh, around the extremality. So how to kick the black hole out of extremality and give it a small infinitesimal temperature and how they behave uh, thermodynamically. And I will corroborate then this, uh, this picture, this study of their near extremal thermodynamics by, uh, uh, by giving you a two-dimensional perspective, meaning describing the perturbation of the near extremal black holes in the framework of uh, models of JT gravity, uh, models which are JT gravity-like in two dimensions. So they're like gravity, like mm, models of gravity plus dilaton in two dimensions. So, okay, let me then just start. Okay, how come this doesn't... Okay, good. So why studying first... So what is the sitter uh, space-time? So the sitter space, you, I'm going to start with also, like this talk will be uh, like, a, I will tell you a lot about a, a lot uh, of basic things, but uh, at least we set the stage uh, very, uh, very concretely. So the sitter space is a maximally symmetric solution to the Einstein's equation uh, with a positive cosmological constant that I will denote via capital lambda in my notation. So there are observational and theoretical reasons uh, why we want to study the sitter space and particular black holes in the sitter space time. Well, first of all, we know that our universe um, had a, an inflationary phase, which was uh, like accelerated expansion, but also nowadays we have the expansion of uh, our universe is expanding and this could be driven by a small vacuum energy and uh, therefore a small cosmological constant. Moreover, uh, we have the lessons from like black holes in ads -CFT, so black holes in anti sitter space, does a lot of uh, lessons about indeed uh, CFTs at finite temperature and so on and so forth. And in the same fashion, uh, in a way, uh, black holes in the sitter could provide valuable insight in the study of the proposed DSCFT correspondence, which is still uh, which is still very much uh, um, uh, not not as much studied as the DSCFT correspondence. So uh, there are differences and, of course, analogies between black holes in the sitter spacetime, uh, which is uh, like positive cosmological constant anti the sitter, which are characterized by a negative cosmological constant, and of course the one that we very well know and studied in Minkowski space, which is the space with uh, zero cosmological constant. One of the striking features of the sitter black holes that then I will also uh, I will also elaborate on uh, further in the. Uh, in the remaining slides is that uh, a de Sitter black hole is characterized by the presence of a cosmological horizon. And this cosmological horizon bounds the black hole uh, in size in, uh, in the Sitter space. And uh, this cosmological horizon in itself can be treated as a thermal entity. So it has a horizon, it has a temperature, and uh, it is, to this cosmological horizon, there is an associated thermodynamics that was studied from the uh, from the very uh, from the very like beginning of black hole thermodynamics uh, by Gibbons and Hawking, for instance. So the thermodynamics at the cosmological horizon satisfies a law, which is uh, which is uh, this one, in which in which you can see that there is a minus sign in front of the uh, in front of the temperature or, and, and in front of the term, which is uh, the temperature and the, the entropy uh, of the cosmological horizon. So there are indeed various subtleties about the thermodynamics 
in the sitter space. For instance, for a black hole in, this, in the sitter space, the black hole has a temperature and the cosmological horizon has a temperature. They don't need to coincide. They coincide just in very specific cases. So but in general, the thermodynamics is a non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So there are this kind of subtlety. Moreover, there is also so no, given the fact that you have a cosmological horizon, there is no asymptotic region where, a, for instance, a conserved mass can be defined. So these are all subtleties, but we will take the pragmatic approach for us to define mass of energy or charge of our space-time in such a way that they reduce to the one that uh, you define very well in Minkowski space in the limit of zero cosmological cost. But I will also talk about this a, a, bit, a bit further in, uh, in the next slides. So black holes in, in the sitter, they are special. They have this cosmological horizon. And uh, in general, we know that for, <coughs> for um, black holes in uh, asymptotically flat or, or asymptotically anti resistor it was pointed out in the past, I think, six or seven years, that interesting patterns arise in specific regime. In particular, in the near extremal regime, so where, when the black hole has a very small temperature, a black hole uh, seems to exhibit some behavior which, are, which is chaotic. For instance, this was pointed out by Maldacena Stanford Young and led to the formulation of the near DS2, near CFT1 correspondence. So, what we would like to study in this uh, uh, so near extremal black holes in Minkowski space and anti sitter space, they are in general very, they are uh, rather well studied. But uh, the black holes in the sitter, they are uh, near extremal black holes in the sitter space, they are not quite, uh, quite studied. So what, what we would like to, um, to perform, uh, like uh, the analysis that we would like to perform, address the question, how does the environment in which the black hole lives modify the new horizon dynamics and the near extremal limits? And indeed, what, you have a, now a cosmological horizon. How does the symmetries, for instance, and uh, the thermodynamics of extremal and near extremal solution uh, are modified by the presence of this cosmological horizon. So in what follows, we will study the phase space of allowed physical solution in, uh, in the sitter space and uh, indeed the perturbation, how the perturbation work if we are very close to extremality. So I will start then with a small review of uh, extremal and near extremal black holes. This is something very basic that I think that probably all of you know, but just to set the stage, I will, I will go on nevertheless. So um, let's start with the simple case of extremal black holes uh, in theories of Einstein, Einstein, Maxwell, uh, Einstein Maxwell. So we all know that the spherically symmetric static solution to the Einstein's equation is the Reister Nordstrom black hole. And, so, and uh, in this case, uh, in this section, I will, just, uh, uh, I will just restrict to zero cosmological constant. So the Reister Nordstrom solution is, uh, is this one. I, uh, I will be very, <laughs> um, I will not, um, okay, I just forgot here to write down the field strength, but it's just a, a, a static spherically symmetric field strength with an with a electric charge. I just set to zero the magnetic charge, but we could also allow for that. So for the, for the Reister Nordstrom black hole, we see that the war factor exhibit up to two roots, and the roots are, uh, are the solution to, like, are the two solutions for the roots are given by this expression here. I hope you can see my, my pointer. Uh, Dan, can you see pointer? Okay, okay. So, um, so this, these two are the inner and the outer horizon of a black hole, and they are real uh, if uh, the mass squared is, uh, uh, the mass is bigger or equal than the charge. And an extremal black hole is found when the mass is equal to the charge. And in particular, it means that it has the minimal mass given a fixed value of the charge. For this black hole, then you have that the two horizons coincide and the work factor has a double root at R plus equals M, which is also equal to Q. So indeed, for this black hole, one can see that the temperature, uh, given the fact that you have two coincident roots, the temperature is zero. So these black holes are stable and they do not radiate. Moreover, there is an enhancement of symmetry. The extremal black hole, they are particularly powerful because indeed there is an enhancement of symmetry, the near horizon geometry. Uh, becomes so the form ADS2 times uh, times S2, and uh, um, the fact that there is a lot of a lot of symmetry and the fact that the solutions are stable enabled uh, enabled some like uh, via some string theory construction the counting of states for a, a large class of these extremal black holes. So indeed the entropy so these black holes have zero temperature but they have non-vanishing area of the event, event horizon so they have a non-vanishing entropy. And in particular, the entropy of these black holes are indeed huge. And you have in, uh, so there are ground states and there is a huge degeneracy of ground states. Let me mention then that also, for, there exists also another version for extreme black hole, uh, which is uh, the, um, 
extremal care black hole, which, uh, which arise when, uh, when indeed you have angular momentum and you can still take the temperature to zero. In that case, you also have an announcement of symmetry in, and the near horizon geometry is ADS2 fibered on, on DS2. So you also have, whenever you have temperature equal zero, you have some, uh, some announcement of your symmetry, at least uh, uh, in particular in the near horizon geometry. Near extremal black holes, so we define near extremal black holes as solutions in which the two horizons are slightly separated one from each other. So indeed, you have that I can do something like this. I can displace the two horizons from their extremal value R0, which was, uh, which was uh, Q, and I will slightly, uh, slightly make them deviate from extremality by inserting, by, um, uh, yes, by including a parameter lambda, which is infinitesimal, and a parameter epsilon, which, uh, which, um, which will be finite in, in this case. So the near a near extremal black hole, if one computes the Hawking temperature, the temperature is no zero, and in particular, it is of order lambda. And a geometry, which I will discuss later, which is called nearly ADS2, appears in the, uh, in the near, near horizon limit. And these black holes correspond to an excited state of the theory. So they're not anymore the ground state, and they have a small temperature, so they're excited state. And one can compute the response to a small increase in temperature, so how the entropy and the mass of the black hole increase given such small increase in temperature. And there are some relations which are like for all the black holes that are no, that have been known yet, they seem to be kind of universal. Uh, and one of the aim of our, of our analysis is to check to which extent these laws are universal. So it seems that if you increase a bit the temperature, the entropy of the black hole scales linearly with temperature. So you have that the total entropy is the, the extremal entropy plus a term which is linear in temperature and inversely proportional to a parameter which is called the mass gap, while the mass uh, scales quadratically with the increase in temperature, so T squared here. And the value of the mass gap is, uh, is inverse, inversely proportional to Q to the third. So this particular quantity here, the mass gap, has a, uh, is a very important quantity because it parameterizes indeed an excitation. Uh, it's, uh, it gives a scale uh, about the excitation energy above extremality. So it is some sort of like an energy gap above the ground state, uh, above, uh, yeah, above the ground states in the micro microscopic spectrum of the black hole. And so, and since we want to, we want to, um, uh, so we have to trust, basically we can trust the, the classical thermodynamics as a semi-equilibrium, equilibrium, uh, let's say, process, like we can trust processes of semi-equilibrium black hole thermodynamics only up to uh, the mass gap. If we want to go below the mass gap, classical thermodynamics is not, is not really a good description anymore. That's why we will need to resort to more, to more sophisticated computations. So black hole excitations above extremality. So these are still in the section of uh, what is known yet. So this low, this response coefficients are all part of uh, all the studies of near extremal asymptotically flat black holes. And all these black hole excitations above extremality have, have been successfully captured by model of JT gravity which are uh, obtained upon reduction of Einstein-Maxwell theory on DS2. So all these models are models of uh, dilaton gravity in two dimensions, where the dilaton parameterizes the size of the sphere. And the, these models of JT gravity had a prominent role in the near ADS2, near CFT1 correspondence, because they describe the conformal symmetry breaking in ADS2. And the same, according to this correspondence, indeed, so this is a new correspondence which it doesn't make use of, for instance, supersymmetry. It arises in, a, in this specific uh, black hole regime and uh, in which the conformal symmetry breaking of ADS2, uh, like this pattern uh, of symmetry breaking, is exactly realized, for instance, in, uh, in models of uh, in the IR behavior of quantum systems, like, for instance, the such the Vieckita F model. So, in, so this is like this is in general one of the prominent features that uh, that allow the formulation of this of this correspondence this particular behavior of uh, of black holes in the near uh, in the near extremal regime so we want to study for instance one of the aspects that i wanted to that i wanted to point out is that we wanted to study how uh, like uh, to which extent the relations that i showed here like these response coefficients black hole once they are taken slightly above extremality uh, whether they are modified or not in scenarios in which, for instance, the black hole is put in an environment which, for instance, has a cosmological constant, with, uh, positive cosmological constant. And we will see that these relations will be indeed slightly modified. So for the Sitter black holes, then we consider 
Same scenario as before, but we add that positive cosmological constant. So we consider an action of this, of this kind, which is Einstein, Maxwell, and the cosmological constant. And again, we look for static and spherically symmetric solutions. And they are the Reister, Nostrum, the Sitter, Black Holes, which are which have the similar form with respect to the. Uh, Morning. Sorry. Sorry. Um, maybe that's. Someone was just on. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, mute. So if we look for statically spherically symmetric uh, solutions, there are the Reister, Nostrum, the Sitter, Black Holes. Unfortunately, there is a typo here. There is a R square missing here. But the second second term is uh, is uh, perfectly fine. So the Reister Nostrum, uh, the Sitter black hole has this form here, in which we can single out. This is the normal Reister Nostrum black hole. There is a term which should be proportional to R squared here, uh, which multiplies the cosmological constant and can be factorized. Uh, and um, so therefore, this word factor um, indeed is uh, like give rise to a quartic order polynomial, uh, like divided by r squared need and we have already singled out the possible which um, and it is quartic order polynomial as uh, could have indeed sorry up to four up to four different different roots in the cases that will be in our interest one of the roots which i called rc2 will be always negative so it would not play a role in our physics however the other the other three roots are very much physical so we denote uh, so um, a black hole in the sitter, like Rasta Nostrum uh, black hole in the sitter, can then have up to three uh, horizons because the roots of the work factor are indeed the horizons in, in this static spherical symmetric case. So we denote with R plus, we'll be, deno uh, we'll be denoting the outer horizon of the black hole, like the one that you have in, in uh, Rasta Nostrum. R minus is the inner horizon. Again, this one you also have in Rasta Nostrum. And RC will be uh, indeed the cosmological horizon. This is something that you don't have, for instance, for asymptotically flat black holes. But the fact that you have a cosmological constant indeed uh, gives the appearance of this further horizon. So uh, let me just uh, uh, try to uh, then write something on the on the black hole because this is, this is like the phase space of possible possible black holes in the sitter. So as I was mentioning before, so a black hole in the sitter has like the charge has an inner horizon, R minus, has a bigger horizon, like outer horizon, which is a plus, and it's surrounded also schematically by a cosmological horizon. So this is like schematically how it is. And if we want uh, black holes with uh, with a uh, with a <laughs> without naked singularity, with a horizon that shield that shields the singularity, we have to be inside the shaded region in the diagram that I showed you here in the slide. So this diagram is called the shark fin because its shape is really like it's really at the shape of a, of a shark fin, where the two values are like absolute value of the charge here and the mass. I hope you can all you can all see. So the shark fin is this sort of this sort of shape here. So these two. So inside here we have real like black holes with event horizon. In the instead. Here, where, where there is the, all the, the, white, um, the white filling, instead you have naked singularity. And the specific uh, lines, which are the extremal lines, bound this sort of bound the, the gray area. So, indeed, the dashed line that I, that I showed in the picture, which is this one, right? it's not dashed, but it's here, denote black holes which are cold, in which the R, the outer horizon, is equal to the inner horizon. So, this is the cold black hole is here the other the other the, the fin instead below is bounded by this line which is the nariai line and these arise where the outer horizon is equal to the cosmological horizon so two horizons coincide here two horizons coincide here but there are different kind of horizons that coincide and at the tip of the shark fin here that is noted with a star we have the ultra cold solution so the ultra cold solution is characterized by having all the three horizons equal. It's a very special point, uh, point in phase space that we will discuss. Uh, the, it will be one of the points that we'll discuss uh, later. It will be a very, um, a very unusual thermodynamic behavior. But so, in the sitter space, we have three different kind of uh, extremal limits, which is something that in Minkowski uh, was not uh, was not possible. In Minkowski, we only had the cold uh, the cold black hole. 
And the, uh, the goal for this talk is indeed to analyze uh, indeed the phase space and sorry, analyze the different excitations above the, these three different extremal limits. So we can start now. Okay, wait. Uh, sorry. Okay, so we can start now with the first case, which is the cold, uh, the cold black hole. So for the cold black hole, you have the, the two horizons, so the inner and the outer horizon coincide. Is the case which is most similar to the Minkowski one, to the extremal riser nostrum in Minkowski. And uh, so these two are equal to R0, and the constraint that for uh, this uh, black hole to be a bona fide black hole with a, with a horizon is that uh, R0 should be uh, smaller than one over square root of lambda. This is a constraint that comes if you study the, the phase space. So the work factor for the cold geometry is displayed uh, in, this, uh, in this slide here. And uh, so R0 is a double root of the of the work factor and the parameters and the mass and the charge of the solution since they have to kind of follow this line they are parameterized by this specific value of uh, of r0 so there is a relation between mass and charge in such a way that you you have to follow to parameterize basically this line so for this sort of configuration then we would like to know what's the new horizon geometry Pretty much the decoupling limit to the new horizon geometry works the same in the same way as in the uh, as in the minkowski case so we have to perform a change of coordinate, which shifts the, the value of R. So that we start from R0 and you add lambda R, where R would be the new coordinate. And you also have to rescale time. So you have a part this particular decoupling limit, which is very well known, in which uh, the limit lambda goes to 0 zooms in into the, new horizon, into the horizon. And the new horizon geometry is simply ADS2 times S2. So for the then the um, uh, so this is the new horizon geometry for the cold black hole, which is here. What we would like to do then is to kick it, uh, kick the black hole a bit out of extremality, meaning that heating up the black hole by displacing the two horizons, as I was showing you before. So what we would like to do is to work in an ensemble of fixed Q, because basically the value as work in an ensemble of fixed Q and also fixed lambda, because basically the the value of lambda and q determine the radius of ADS2, which we want to, to keep fixed. So what we would like to do uh, is... To Kara, can, can you see the bound on R0 once you take the near horizon limit, or do you lose that information completely? Uh, I think that... So I don't have here exactly the... Um, the how to say? The value for, for this R0. These expressions are a bit more complicated, but it will be for sure this value here, this bound here, will, for instance, show up uh, in the mass gap. You will see that this value here is such a way that the mass gap is positive. So you will have, let's say, remnants of this bound in the thermodynamics. Okay, thanks. I will show you, but I am, okay, if you want, I can, I can look up the formulas uh, later to see what happens if you, uh, if you, um, yeah, I, yeah. We'll see. For now, we don't see that exactly in the in the new horizon limit. But so, okay, uh, what I wanted to say is, yes, so for the thermodynamics, we work at fixed charge and fixed lambda. And so we want to move, basically, coming from a cold black hole here, we would like to move inside the thing in this direction here. So we keep charge fixed, and then we move along, along this line here. We move inside the fin because we would like to stay in a uh, in a setup in which the horizon the, in which the black hole is a has a really a horizon we cannot move in this direction because otherwise we'll have a naked singularity so we move horizontally inside the fin from the cold geometry so we slightly separate these two horizons as i was mentioning before so r plus and r minus like we take r minus to be a tiny bit uh, a tiny bit smaller and r plus a tiny bit bigger and the new horizon metric uh given the same decoupling limit, is of the form uh, near ADS2 times S2, which is this sort of, uh, this sort of geometry here. And uh, this geometry here is indeed something that we call near ADS2 times S2. And uh, with a particular diffeomorphism, we can act on ADS2 times S2 uh, to bring it to this form here. So the temperature for the black hole, so given this displacement of the horizon, then we can also compute the temperature of the black hole because there are, there are explicit formulas, it's very easy. So we see that the temperature, we, we, we computed it at the outer horizon. 
So the temperature is of the order lambda, given the displacement of the two horizon. And indeed, the entropy and the mass uh, change according to the uh, to the same rule as we according to the same formula that we have shown before for Minkowski black holes. So indeed, the entropy of the outer horizon uh, scales linearly with the temperature, and the mass scales quadratically with the temperature. And uh, if you compute the mass gap, the mass gap is uh, um, has this value here, in which you see that given the bound on R zero, which should be bigger than one over square root of two lambda. The mass gap is positive indeed. So indeed, for for the cold K, for the cold solution, if you increase the temperature, also you increase the black hole mass. As you can really see it from here, that indeed increasing the temperature and going inside the fin, the mass also increases. It's something like uh, like very easy to see. Moreover, let me mention also that the change in cosmological horizon instead in the area of the of the cosmological horizon is of the order lambda square. So this can also be seen as an ensemble of fixed cosmological horizon, let's say, because it varies at higher order in lambda. So the next case is the Nariai black hole. So the, sorry, the Nariai geometry, which is which is this one, like in the lower part of the fin. So again, so if for this geometry here, the outer horizon is equal to the cosmological horizon, and the constraint is uh, is however is exactly the opposite with respect to the one that we had found in uh, uh, in the cold uh, in the cold geometry. So R zero needs to be bigger than one over square root of two lambda. The new horizon geometry is the S two times S2, and uh, it formally co coincides, well, it's, the form of this uh, geometry is very similar with respect to what you had before. If you, if you see it uh, very, if you see it carefully, it's just that there is just a, a, a um, change of signature on the matrix. And so this is DS2 times S2. And this is given, given by the fact that you're, you're setting equal two different, two roots with respect to, uh, in this case, in the Nayar, you're setting equal R plus and RC, while in the cold, you were setting equal R plus and R minus. So separating a bit the two horizons, you get, a, uh, again, like before, you get a geometry which is near the S2 times S2, which has this form, very similar to what you had before. And the mass and the entropy change uh, formula are also similar to the one that you had in the cold case. So the Nariai and the cold case they have some differences in sign, for instance, but the formulas themselves and the value of the mass gap like coincide. So the value of the mass gap is exactly the same as before, but now we have that the, the constraint on R0 is the opposite. So it means that the mass gap for Nariai is actually negative. So the mass gap is, uh, is negative, and it's also to be expected because indeed we move from the right edge of the diagram here. So if you want to keep a, a horizon, the mass upon an increase, an increase in, uh, in temperature, the mass needs to decrease. Notice that in the change in the entropy of the, of the cosmological horizon, instead it's positive. So we displace the horizon in such a way that there is an increase in the cosmological horizon. The mass gap is negative, so this term totally is positive. So the entropy, change, the entropy becomes bigger, but the mass, the mass uh, uh, indeed like, um, just uh, becomes smaller. So this is for the Nariai case. So the ultra cold solution instead is like uh, is something that it's uh, um, that it's indeed uh, like very special, and it co corresponds to the point at the tip at the tip of the fin here. So there is no uh, so the parameter in the um, in the ultra cold solution are fixed to this value here. So this is at R zero. You have uh, R zero needs to be exactly one over two square root of two lambda. And the mass and the charge should have this value here. It's exactly one point in phase space. So this, uh, uh, the work factor for the ultra cold solution is uh, indeed uh, um, is uh, arise like uh, has a triple root, like it has three coincident uh, three coincident horizons, so three coincident roots. And in order to have a well defined decoupling limit, you need to engineer a, a coordinate change, which is somehow special. This was due to Booth and Mann. Uh, actually also in a, in a paper by Ross and Mann. But so you see that there is a funny scaling lambda to the three halves, uh, while before the decoupling limit, um, sorry, the decoupling limit that we had, for instance, for the cold black hole, only, uh, only like the parameter lambda that was sent to zero uh, was appearing only linear in the reparameterization of the radius. So the fact that you have three horizon and a triple root in your, uh, in your work factor, um, I mean, in such a way that if you want a well-defined decoupling limit to the new horizon geometry, you need to have this funny scaling in the in the 
in the rescaling in the shifting of the of the radial and on the and on the rescaling of the time co time coordinate but so in any way if you perform this coordinate change and you send lambda to zero you see that the near horizon geometry is minkowski 2 times s2 so this is minkowski 2 and then this is uh, s2 with uh, the radius r0 squared which is exactly this one so you see that it's a funny case we, we didn't find it before uh, this kind of geometry was not there for extremal black holes in flat space so and this means that indeed we have all the three cases like uh, for the sitter black holes we have ads2 times s2 ds2 times s2 and for the ultra cold solution in particular via the scaling you have minkowski 2 times s2 so there are all these extremal configurations that we are trying to uh, to heat up so yeah, for i'm sorry uh, i'm a little confused uh, about this funny three halves so what is what is determining the three halves versus one I mean, why why can't i just call lambda the three halves lambda tilde no 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 it's more like uh what I wanted to say is that indeed you have two. Um, so while you have two um, in the cold and sorry, the cold and in a real case, you have a double root of the um, you have a double root of the world factor, but here you have a triple root. So in a way to make such a way to reabsorb your uh, and to kind of make sure that the limit uh, to the horizon is like um, to the nearest on geometry is well defined to have a well defined decoupling limit. You have you will have to modify this coefficient here with respect to what you had before. Roughly speaking, before you had a double root, so you had lambda. Now it's the triple root, and it's uh, lambda to the three halves. It's like if you want a square root of the of the degree of the root. What I don't understand is, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, lambda is a dummy is a dummy parameter. You're, you're going to take lambda to zero, and it will completely disappear in the end. Yes, so yes. there has to be another thing that de that determines you know uh, the relative rate. So if you were telling me that there is a near extremality parameter that was scaling like lambda, then this lambda the three halves would be meaningful. But now that there is only this lambda the three halves, I don't see how it's different from just being lambda or lambda. To the okay, so eight. okay, okay, yes, fine. This will will okay. If you want, I can show you later. So the near extremal, uh, sorry, the here. The limit, to, even in the extremal configuration, is just a bit more special. You have to kind of shift a bit your horizons, like R0 and so on. So these are more involved. Uh, yeah, as you said, OK, it's not quite. Um, so still, this lambda to the three halves is due to the fact that you have a triple root. The decoupling limit, you have to first shift and uh, modify a bit your, um, your three roots in order to be able to get Minkowski 2 times S2. So this is in a paper I can show you maybe later. It's in a paper by Booth and Mann. So the the coupling limit is like it's not quite the same as in the cold and in the NARI. Uh, you have to do some more passages within that. So maybe that's what you mean. Oh, so this this First, coordinate transformation that you you gave us here is not sufficient for me to derive the Minkowski times S2? Not quite. So you have to do a, a tiny bit passage before that, which means slightly, uh, I mean, there is some small mm -hmm. passage that you have to, to do before, which coincides to a small shift in the radial coordinate and, mm -hmm. uh, and some other, uh, well, I can, I can probably, okay. let's see how, to, okay, I can, maybe I can show you later in the, in the paper by Booth and Mann. I didn't report it here, but what, okay. Okay, I think that probably I know what uh, I know what you meant, but yes, I would say that still the lambda to the three halves is related to the fact that you have a triple a triple root. You have to be a bit more careful. You cannot take exactly this limit. You have to do a bit more passages before that. But what you, what you get is that indeed for the uh, extrema configuration, you get Minkowski two times s two. So this is the near horizon geometry that you land. Okay. Okay. So um, okay, so this is the uh, ultra cold solution that, that lies at the tip of the tip of the shark fin. There is indeed our strategy for heating up the ultra cold, meaning to kind of uh, to um, give temperature to this solution, is uh, indeed special though because I mean we are in the, at the tip of the of the fin here, so we are at the ultra cold point, but we see that both moving in one direction or in the other direction, we land into a naked singularity. So what we need to do is that to move inside the fin along this direction. So along the, the diagonal, let's say. 
And uh, along the line that I have uh, that I have denoted here with a dashed red line, so really you have to move inside in such a way to encounter still black gold with a with a well defined uh, with a bona fide event horizon. So we cannot really indeed um, we will be in a different ensemble in which. Uh, we don't keep the charge and charge fixed, but we will work in an ensemble in which the charge is, uh, is allowed to vary. So what we, what, we do, what we did in our case is that we uh, indeed, uh, so we displace the three horizons um, with, with the, and we give an additional freedom to the, to the parameters. So we introduced other two parameters, W1 and W2, that we take at this point to be generic. And uh, uh, so if the R plus and R minus uh, vary with, um, uh, with this, like if we displace them via this formula, formula like R0 minus W1 and R0 minus W2, automatically RC varies with this relation here. This is something that, that comes just really by equating more factors. And if we uh, indeed displace it along, uh, along uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of formula, the temperature that we get is of the order lambda squared. So in previous cases, we have that the temperature is of the order lambda. So it seems that even if we displace the horizon in, in this way, even no matter which kind of values of W1 and W2, we have that the temperature, the black hole, <laughs> it is really ultra cold, I mean, it's very cold, meaning that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really get heated up. Uh, the new horizon geometry uh, that you get by performing like a suitable decoupling limit is really like is a similar a similar form with respect to the previous one, but indeed these k's are only constant factors. So this is r zero is a constant uh, is a constant value of r. Epsilon is again constant. Epsilon would be related sorry to w one and w two in particular parameterization. So the presence of this uh, non extremal parameter epsilon, which is related to w one and w two, is indeed trivial. So meaning that this can be completely reabsorbed via rescaling of of t. This is the time coordinate and R. So it means that we cannot really heat up the, the solution. So if we just displace the horizons, we have that the thermodynamic quantities varies of order lambda squared. However, the entropy varies. The entropy is indeed uh, proportion, the entropy variation is proportional to lambda, so it's linear in lambda, while the uh, variation of uh, in temperature is quadratic in lambda. So this is like something like different with respect to what we have found before. And uh, the change in entropy is, however, driven not by a change in temperature because I'm sorry, the change in entropy <laughs> is uh, driven by a change in chemical potential because also the chemical potential varies of order lambda. So it's the only quantity in the thermodynamics relation that varies at order lambda. So indeed, the entropy, the entropy change is related to a change in chemical potential rather than a change in temperature, because the temperature is just uh, subleading and it's case, it's case like lambda squared. So to recap, we have found that indeed, so the cold and Nariai geometries can indeed be heated up and they have a response coefficient, which, is very, which are very similar to the ones that we had in Minkowski space or also Previous studies I didn't mention, but there were studies in also in anti-deceiter space for extre near extremal black holes in anti-deceiter space. So the response coefficients are this one. We have computed the mass gap and they fit into the normal relation that we had before. But for the ultra cold geometry, we have that just by, simply by displacing the horizons from extremality, the response in temperature is subleading and the change in entropy is rather due to the chemical potential. And indeed, the specific heat in this case, which is the inverse of Cs, which is defined in this one. So in this case, its specific heat is infinite because like this right hand side is, uh, is zero, so Cs is infinite. And this is reminiscent of other studies, for instance, by the group in Vienna, which studied to the gravity in flat space. And this will have indeed, like this will play a role in our, in our analysis. So we have found this sort of behavior in the thermodynamics of near extremal black holes in the sitter. What we would like to do is to corroborate this picture with the study of perturbation in the two-dimensional analysis. So the study of perturbations in a model, uh, sorry, the study of uh, two-dimensional models which describe the perturbations above extremality. There will be models of JT gravity. So uh, in order to corroborate this picture, this thermodynamic behavior, we also, uh, what we did is that we studied the reduction to two dimensions of Einstein-Maxwell lambda on S2. So 
we uh, we took this sort of ansatz for the metric in which the sphere is this is uh, and the size of the sphere is parameterized by the field phi which is the dilaton and then we assume the generic metric for the t and r component which is uh, gab and also we assume that the field strength is purely um, purely in the rt direction so it's a purely electric field strength and the field phi we will call it, we will call it the dilaton and the resulting to the two dimensional action that you get is an action for which the Ricci scalar is multiplied by phi squared and it has also further couplings between, for instance, the, the scalars, like further uh, potential for the scalars and uh, couplings between the scalars and, uh, and the field strength. And the resulting to the action is a dilaton gravity model, which shares many features with JT gravity and also with the CGHS models, which describe uh, gravity in asymptotically to the gravity in asymptotically flat space. So we will consider then. So given this two-dimensional model, we will consider perturbations around uh, geometry in the IR, which will have a constant dilaton. Which means that uh, our IR geometry will be a geometry of uh, fixed uh, size of the sphere because the dilaton is like is the size of the sphere, and will also have a constant uh, Ricci scalar which determines indeed the curvature of the two-dimensional manifold, which is parameterized in, in this way. So you see that depending on the value of the dilaton that you have, the Ricci scalar, the curvature of the two-dimensional uh, two dimensional manifold can, can be either negative, positive, or zero. So this is really reflects the fact that you can have uh, ADS2 times S2, DS2 times S2, or Minkowski 2 times S2. So it accommodates all these three cases. So what we want to do is from this 2D model is that we want to start from this IR geometry with constant dilaton and then compute perturbations on top of that. For instance, we, we perturb the dilaton, we displace the dilaton from its initial value and we consider the linear perturbation which is parameterized by the field that we call Y. And also we consider perturbation of the matrix here and also on the gauge field, especially in the ultra cold case. In the case where we'll have cold and REI, this term here will not will not play any role. But so once you uh, once you consider this sort of perturbation, you plug it into and you compute the equations of motion coming from here, you get that the linearized equation. So the equations for the perturbation assume this form. So this is what we are gonna solve for our two cases, so these two equations. So we'll start with the cold black hole. So the cold black hole geometry, as I was mentioning, the, ADS, uh, the New Horizon geometry is ADS2 times S2. So we start with an ADS2 New Horizon geometry. So this will be our background matrix. And it's also like our background gauge field, which is which I didn't write it here, but it's something that, uh, that can be computed via the Maxwell's equation. So we start from this background geometry, which contains, so this is ADS, ADS2, but it contains also like uh, also some additional function which reflects the possible diffeomorphism that you can act to. Uh, so this is, this metric here is still Ricci scalar, which is equal to minus two, but uh, but it also contains two additional functions. So the solutions for the dilaton and for the metric in this case can be really readily found. They can be easily adapted from the study of Maldacena, Stanford, and Young, and the dilaton has this particular behavior here in which we found two functions which are dependent on t, mu, and theta, and we can find solutions for them. So in this case, we actually uh, <clears throat> we actually decided to write beta, which is one, um, one function appearing in the background matrix. So this would be a source, uh, a source for the dual operator, and uh, theta of t, which is, uh, so it's more handy to parameterize the solution with beta and, uh, and theta. And uh, we can also find us like a fully closed and analytic solution for the metric perturbation. And all the, all the solutions are indeed parameterized by alpha, which appears here in the background metric, and mu, which appears here in the, in the, background, in the, in the full solution. So once, uh, so we have, uh, we have need to check that, so for the black hole, so for, sorry, for the background metric, uh, background metric is this one, when, once we restrict to uh, constant coefficient alpha and beta, <clears throat> one can see that actually the background matrix has a horizon, which is a two-dimensional black hole. And so we, uh, we, this horizon has an associated temperature and entropy, which can be readily computed in, with, this, um, with the known formulas. So the temperature is proportional to the square root of 
alpha and beta, and the temperature, and, sorry, and the entropy is computed as the dilaton at the horizon. Indeed, it coincides, uh, the change in entropy coincides with the, um, with the variation, so with the, like you have a term for the background, responsible for the, um, for the S0, so extremal entropy, and the first correction is, uh, <coughs> is proportional to the value of the dilaton at the horizon. So we have checked that indeed, even from the two-dimensional perspective, um, these formulas here agree with the relation uh, that it's in 4D for which the, the change in entropy of the outer horizon is linear in the temperature with the same value of the mass gap that we found before. So this is indeed exactly mirroring our analysis in, um, in 4D. Moreover, we have computed the normalized shell action for these solutions. So you have to plug in the, the solution that you found in the two-dimensional action that is here. You have to remove divergences by adding counter term. And then uh, you get a finite uh, on shell action for which you can really see that the linear response in temperature of the entropy, which is this one, comes indeed from the Schwarzian effective action. So this term here, so the on shell action here can be recast as M minus TS my, uh, plus phi Q. This is just the on shell action for a 2D black hole. And you can see that indeed the linear response in temperature that you were finding here um, <clears throat> comes indeed from a short action. And the coefficient of this term is exactly uh, like a, exactly reproduces the mass gap coefficient that we had found in the previous section. So the, this seems to, to match exactly what we had found in the 4D analysis. <coughs> it's to the, the analysis is mostly to corroborate the picture that we found before. So for Sorry, that, that answer doesn't include the fluctuation determinant. That's just the classical solution that gives. Yes. In this case, we just have the classical solution and we plug it into the onshell action. Okay. And we and we subtract the divergences. For now, we don't have any, we don't do any one loop determinant or so on. Um, so for the um, for the Nariai, so we did the cold in the cold case. We we got uh, we got that. Um, for the Nariai case, pretty much the solutions are so we start from the background solution, which is DS2 in the infl so called inflationary patch. It differs from the previous cold case as just from some signs. And the solution themselves are indeed formally equivalent to what you have in the cold case. So you can still solve the solutions, solve the equations. It is very easy because also it um, it indeed like it is obtained from the cold solution upon performing the transfer like some sort of like rotation which sends rho into i rho and l ds into i l a so we can take the solution that we had before and we can generate a new one that solved the equations of motion for the ds2 solution and again we have constraints between the the functions appearing for instance we can solve for theta and beta so this is for what concerns the inflationary patch to make contact with the with the near near DS2 matrix, we would like to move to the static patch in order to um, yeah in order to make contact with the near extremal matrix that we found from 4D. So we change coordinates from rho to the coordinate r, and we also take these two functions to be uh, to have a specific value, and this turns out to um, like turns our background matrix into a matrix that looks like the static patch. However, the radius, like the radius that we found here, is not quite the one of the static patch, but it's of a horizon which lies beyond the, the cosmological horizon. Because in this case, what we found from this coordinate transformation here is such that R needs to be bigger than uh, LDS, so which is some, somehow not quite the one, the one that we had before. And the solution also has a linear dilaton solution. So a matrix, which is like this one, so we have shown that indeed a matrix like this can be obtained via suitable near extremal limit coming from the Nariai configuration. But of course, how to extend uh, these coordinates to, um, to cover an observer which is inside the cosmological horizon? So with R, which is less than LDS, is still somehow a, a bit uh, unclear. So we tried, for instance, to start with generic complex functions. For instance, we start with generic uh, alpha and beta, which are complex, and uh, we, uh, we try to um, to enforce some reality conditions of the matrix, but somehow we, we, our study was not very conclusive. We didn't find exactly uh, something that could be consistent. So for now, what we have is that 
what we can claim is that a metric like this one with R bigger than LDS can be reached via suitable near extremal limit starting from the Nariai configuration. For the solution that covers the server inside the horizon, it's still something that we don't, uh, we don't quite know how to do. But okay, so we come now to the, okay, I think I'm, uh, I'm almost uh, done, but okay, we start now um, with the perturbations uh, in the ultra cold case, which is uh, somehow the most interesting uh, case. So as we, men as we mentioned- Chiara, And there was no, uh, no JT gravity explanation for the correction to entropy etc yeah no for that one we did not we did not quite uh, um, do that also because the holographic normalization for the CTR2 was a bit tricky so we decided not to okay. not to perform that uh, that analysis i mean yeah it's something that we we just discussed the the solutions but not quite what and the uh, the fact that you can get this metric but not quite the the actual action for instance okay. mm -hmm. but in the case of minkowski 2 we managed we managed to do that so we solved the JT, uh, JT equations for, um, so we solved the perturbation equation for the metric, which is uh, Minkowski 2, like 2D metric. So we put first Minkowski 2 in the Eddingston Finkelstein coordinates, which means that we parameterize it with the uh, with coordinates u and r, r hat, and with two additional function p and u, which depend on u. The solution for the perturbations are actually very simple to find. The solution for the dilaton, it's just something which is which has a linear part in R and a constant part where the two functions depend on U, and the two functions are solutions to these two equations. And also the metric perturbation can be found exactly into into a closed form which depend on A and uh, A and B. And in this case, also let me mention that we uh, we also let the charge uh, vary because indeed we uh, uh, we don't. We don't fix a value of uh, charge because we need to go inside the shark fin. So for these solutions, <coughs> the solution are quite, I mean, you need to solve these two equations, but for the rest, they are, they are explicit. There is some particular, particular um, solutions that you find with constant coefficient P0 and, and uh, T0, then you can solve exactly your functions and you can readily integrate them. You get these two solutions here. And this is, this is of the same form as a solution found by these two guys, uh, um, Victor Godet and Charles Marteau, in the case of CGS, CGHS hat models. So this is a solution which has constant coefficient P0 and T0, which indeed reflects what we found, what we find uh, from the ultra cold, uh, ultra cold geometry in which uh, P0 and T0 were constant. So this is the, the solution that is of our interest, uh, our uh, major interest, let's say. So let me just mention here that, so, Given the fact that from the near um, near ultra cold geometry, near extreme ultra cold geometry, we found a solution which has p zero constant, t zero constant, and also static solution. So we can also try to study a subset of the solution, which is the static one, in which we set a one uh, to zero and also b two to zero. We see that indeed in that particular case, the static solution becomes independent of the background matrix at fixed charge. And this is very different with respect to what you have for the ADS case. In the ADS case, if you remember, you had that there was this sort of somehow uh, entanglement between all these uh, all these functions here, alpha, beta, which appear in the background matrix, and beta and theta. But in this case, instead, we have that <clears throat> at fixed charge, you don't have uh, any, so the solution becomes independent of the background matrix, which is already something which shows a different behavior. Moreover, if we impose linear dilaton boundary conditions, you have that phi r, like with the phi r fixed, so this is the um, a solution for which the dilaton goes linearly with r, at least at infinity, you have that the arbitrary charge variations are not allowed. There is a relation between this phi r and delta q. So let's go back now to the, uh, to the, to the picture with the black hole. So also in this case, as in the ADS2, um, in two dimensions, the metric is such that uh, we have a black hole solution in 2D, and the horizon is located at this particular value here. And one can compute also the temperature for the uh, for this black 2D black hole, and it's uh, and it's this one. It's proportional to p0. And the solution is indeed this one, where we we got a static solution. So if you compute the entropy as the um, as the the value of the extremal solution plus the per perturbation due to the dilaton, 
you have these two pieces here. One piece, which is proportional to B0, which is this integration constant here, which is just a constant. And a funny term here that we did not expect in our, in our analysis, which is proportion, inversely proportional to the, to the temperature. So let's analyze these two cases. So if you remember, in the, um, from the, for the analysis, we had found that uh, the entropy was not changing. Um, so the change in entropy was of order lambda, but the change in temperature was of the order lambda square. So it seems that there was no, um, the, the specific heat was infinite, meaning that there was no change in entropy given a change in temperature and vice versa. Let's say, so the first term that we found here is uh, uh, consistent with this picture. So meaning that there is no change in entropy due to temperature because the first term, um, in the first term, only the constant B0 appears, but this B0 does not appear in any other, um, in any formula for the temperature. So that is consistent with what we have. The second term was a bit surprising, but it's something that, that we, uh, that, that we double check and it seems that it's, uh, it's indeed there. So the second term is uh, uh, indeed surprising, uh, mostly because indeed it doesn't have a smooth limit when the temperature goes to zero. So indeed, when the temperature of the 2D black hole goes to zero, then you have, uh, you have infinite. So you have to impose other, other sort of uh, boundary conditions. So in order to have this to work, to have a smooth limit at, at uh, temperature goes to zero, you have to either impose that tau, like this parameter tau zero is uh, zero, which is the choice that was made by these people here. So in this case, indeed, you, you, you need to have that the entropy, the change in entropy, there is no change in entropy due to the temperature. Or you need to set delta Q equals to zero as well, because delta Q was related indeed to phi R. So you kill this term here, so this entire term vanish. Or again, modify the boundary condition in such a way that delta Q is equal to, uh, to the temperature squared, in such a way that you get exactly that uh, here, for temperature <clears throat> going to zero, you have a well-defined limit. So this was a bit surprising. This, let's say that we expected something like the first term. We did not expect a term like, like the second one, but imposing tau zero equals zero, which is the one that usually the people that are doing asymptotically flat JT gravity do. Indeed, it seems that the entropy indeed has no change with respect to changing change in temperature. So the, the entropy has no change with respect to a change in temperature. We finally uh, computed the normalized Donchell action for this, uh, for this sort of black hole. So again, there are other counterterms that one needs to supplement your 2D action with. You plug in the solution and you have that for constant value of <coughs> P0 and, and um, T0, the Donchell action assumes this, uh, um, this very simple form. I global is just uh, the part of the action that depends only on the horizon. So we, we just uh, left it on the side for the moment. And if we if you compute the temperatures, this is again in the case in which delta Q equals to zero, you see that if you compute the temperature in this uh, according to this formula, you have that the temperature is simply equal to minus the Onshell action. So it's simply equal to this part here. So it means that this term here is vanished. So the temperature does not affect in the Onshell action. So uh, actually the temperature does not affect uh, uh, yes, the Onshell action indeed. So this is very different than what, uh, what was happening in the cold and in the Nariai case in which T was the leading effect indeed of the deformation and the Oshel action indeed depend on the temperature. So, okay, I come now to the conclusion because it's already one hour. So we have seen now that we have corroborated the picture like with some subtleties, of course, but we managed to corroborate the picture in which we found the thermodynamic behavior in 4D uh, reflected in the perturbation that you get from the new horizon geometry in 2D. And we have seen how indeed the environment that contains the black hole, the fact that you have this positive cosmological constant, affect the thermodynamic response. The cosmological constant uh, away from extremalities, oh, sorry, cosmological constant, for instance, enters in the mass gap for our black holes. And this is something that uh, indeed affects the thermodynamics. And uh, we have studied indeed, as I showed you, that the effect of the cosmologi positive cosmological constant results in three different limits with different behavior, especially for the ultra cold, heating up the ultra cold geometry, me going to this direction here, is, uh, is somehow a bit tricky. It's, it's not the same as we would have in the other two cases, in the other cold and the eye case. So let me give you, so this was just a, a 
small toy model to see how indeed the environment of the black hole um, is reflected in the near horizon, in the near extrema limit. A similar analysis, one could do um, a similar analysis, for instance, in higher dimensions or for black holes, which are, uh, uh, which have angular momentum. We partially did that, at least in the four dimensional case, the JT gravity analysis will be much more complicated because you don't have, you cannot reduce input on the sphere. But for the 4D, from the 4D point of view, indeed also care the sitter admit an ultra cold and an REI limit. So this is something that uh, we partially have done, like we didn't include it in the paper, but it's something that can be done. And it would be nice to see what are indeed the, the JT description of these sort of solutions. And, uh, and see. so this is something probably for the future, but uh, it would be yeah, still interesting to see whether the addition of angular momentum, I think the, 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 the phase space will be very similar to the shark fin. So uh, the, I foresee that even for extremal and near extremal care desitter, in the ultra cold case, you'll also have this sort of uh, non dependence on the change in time in um, in entropy with respect to a change in temperature. And uh, and that's it, I think. So thanks for the thanks for the attention. Okay, thank you, Chiara, for a fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for questions. So anybody who has one, just unmute and go ahead. Yeah, hi, Chiara, thanks. Um, hi, yes. Uh, just a clarifying thing, uh, I probably just missed it, but can you tell us again? So in the in the flood case, yes, the near extremal near horizon space time. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Is it just Rindler? Uh, I saw the metric at some point, but I was confused. Uh, how do you define the temperature for that two D metric? Um, sorry, which one? Uh, you see. So you uh, in the flood case. Mm -hmm. Right, so you've got this. Yes. This doesn't look like a black hole to me, uh, and doesn't look like it has a horizon. How do you define the temperature of this horizon? Of this no, no, map? this, uh, I mean, um, no, this is just, a, yeah, I would say it's just Minkowski. The temperature that you get from, you have to compute the temperature from the, from the black hole geometry in 4D, right? So you have that, uh, basically you use this formula, which is, uh, here I explained, here is for the for the cold geometry, but the same is valid in the ultra cold geometry. And you see that if these two coincide, basically if these two coincide, but also these two coincide, you have automatically a term in order lambda squared. I see. So so that's very different from the ADS and the DS case. Right? So in the ADS exactly. case, you I... had the Rindler horizon, you know, or from the from in the DS case, you also had the you know the horizon of the static patch. Mm -hmm. That were yes. at least killing horizons, and you could you could associate uh, you know a surface gravity to them and call call whatever that defines as you yes. know, the Hawking okay. temperature of the corresponding to the black hole. There's nothing like that in the flat case you're telling me, right? The near no, extreme exactly. of the near horizon but, limit just yields Minkowski. It doesn't even yield a Rindler space. Yes, at least in for um, for our let's say the coupling limit. Yes, you get you something get like this. this. Yes, which is not quite, I mean, these are just a uh, constant, yeah, just parameters, right? So you can just reabsorb into these two. Yeah, that's surprising, isn't it? I would expect that you should have gotten just to the Ranger space time and with its associated temperature. I mean, I have to say that also, uh, I mean, there might be other decoupling limits that we are not quite considering uh, in mm -hmm. the, in the near extremal, um, ultra cold geometry, we had to engineer a decoupling limit starting from this one that uh, yeah, I yeah. can I can show you a bit the, the paper in which this or I can send you the paper yes, if you want. Um, so it could be that we are just not uh, I mean, this is pretty general, right? I mean, this is how we are displacing the roots in a very generic way, like we, we leave these coefficients um, uh, like uh, unfixed. This needs to be uh, this is something that needs to be uh, satisfied because of consistency. I don't know if then there is some other decoupling limit, which is not quite this. We also introduced an epsilon, like a, and uh, epsilon is related to W2 and W1 into this sort of um, parameterization. It's of course yeah. not unique. So maybe 
I don't know if we are, if we are uh, yeah, I don't know if we are probably picking one decoupling limit, which singles out a particular horizon geometry or if there can be others. Yeah, but in any case, the temperature you define for these two D space times is, is is not easy to identify with the geometry, right? You, it's just at the... least not not in our not in our um, in our setup here that we get yeah. from the four D thing. Then, of course, like yeah. if you work, yes. If you work instead with the with the edit on Finkelstein coordinates with all these functions and so on, then you can define a temperature which is proportional to this p p zero and so on, but not quite from here that's also probably uh, the origin of uh, the fact that it seems that here we just really cannot heat it up <laughs> heat up this uh, geometry yeah okay so i don't know if it's something that it's our uh i mean just naively the punchline of of this is that uh we just by displacing the horizon doesn't give you uh, an effect uh, at the level of a temperature somehow at least not in this uh, in this sort of ultra cold geometry right but it yeah. still gives you some effect at the level of the entropy just by definition because you're displacing the horizons <laughs> but it just doesn't seem that it's driven by a change in temperature mm, that's at least what it seems that we find yes got it thanks All right, if there are no other questions, let's thank Kiara again. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording and see you all next week. Thank you.